so today we are super excited to be speaking to Lilia, who is an Icelandic crime writer and an award-winning playwright. She began a new crime series in 2015 uh, with Snare, which went on to be an international bestseller. She has now um, won the Book of the Year awards of The Guardian, and her latest book in the series has been picked up by Paloma Pictures in California and is going to be made into a film. Um, and we are really excited today to talk to Lilia about her world of crime and also how she has been translating her books to an international audience. Well, thank you Lilia. very much. And Quentin, thank you so much for joining us again to sort of talk to us about the whole incredible process of translating these books. So Lilia, we wanted to start by talking about you as a writer and we're kind of fascinated by your career and how you got into it and how you are also a playwright. So how did you get into writing? What, what inspired you and what's that journey been like? Well, uh, I, I, I always liked to write, you know, uh, when I was young and when I was a child I wrote a lot of, of short stories about speaking animals. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, and then in college I, I did the occasional short story and, uh, you know, for the school papers and stuff. And then just life got in the way. I, I uh, studied uh, as a secretary first and then I went to university and, and, and uh, studied um, education systems and theory of education and uh, then it was in 2008 that I saw an advertisement in the in, a, in the paper it was a, from an Icelandic publisher that said um, we are looking for the new Dan Brown and uh, I thought yeah that's me so uh, I wrote the book and sent it into the competition but it, uh, this was 2008, so uh, the Icelandic bank crash came. You know, the big bank crash was horrible in Iceland, so um, all the prize money evaporated and they cancelled the competition. So, But the book still got published. So today we are super excited to be speaking to Lilia, who is an Icelandic crime writer and an award-winning playwright. She began a new crime series in 2015, uh, with Snare, which went on to be an international bestseller. She has now um, won the Book of the Year awards of The Guardian, and her latest book in the series has been picked up by Paloma Pictures in California, and is going to be made into a film. Um, and we are really excited today to talk to Lilia about her world of crime, and also how she has been translating her books to an international audience. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. And Quentin, thank you so much for joining us again to sort of talk to us about the whole incredible process of translating these books. So Lilia, we wanted to start by talking about you as a writer and we're kind of fascinated by your career and how you got into it and how you are also a playwright. So how did you get into writing? What, what inspired you and what's that journey been like? Well, uh, I, I, I always liked to write, you know, uh, when I was young and when I was a child I wrote a lot of, of short stories about speaking animals. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, and then in college I, I did the occasional short story and, uh, you know, for the school papers and stuff. And then just life got in the way. I, I uh, studied uh, as a secretary first and then I went to university and, and, and uh, studied um, education systems and theory of education and uh, then it was in 2008 that I saw an advertisement in the in, a, in the paper it was a, from an Icelandic publisher that said um, we are looking for the new Dan Brown and uh, I thought yeah that's me so uh, I wrote the book and sent it into the competition but it, uh, this was 2008, so uh, the Icelandic bank crash came. You know, the big bank crash was horrible in Iceland, so um, all the prize money evaporated and they cancelled the competition. So, But the book still got published, so that was my first book. Uh, and uh, then I wrote another one, and then I uh, went into writing for theatre and did that for a while, and uh, then... Uh, I came back to crime uh, with with snare. Mm -hmm. So here we are, a few books later. And yeah. what was it that inspired um, crime as your sort of genre for writing? Uh, I, I 
in a way, I like to think that it was kind of a coincidence because of the advertisement. I just, uh, they were looking for a crime novel and I, I thought, yeah, I can do that. But, but when I think back, I mean, I, I have always read everything, but, but crime is really what I like the most. You know, um, uh, I, I was uh, brought up in a very literary home. My, my grandfather was a, a writer and a poet. And my father has written a lot of um, historical uh, books and uh, also textbooks for colleges. And uh, so publishing a book is something that, you know, kind of goes in the family, even if there are, you know, different types and different genres. So, um, but uh, I, I always... I mean, my father was very literary and, and when I was little made me, you know, long reading lists with the, the world literature and the Nobel Prize winners and all that. But my mother was a, was a, a crime fiction fan. So she always suggested, you know, crime fiction to me, even from, from when I was a child, like Enid Blyton basically is, is many of her books are, are cra set up like crime fiction. And um, so it's it's the reading that gives me most pleasure. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is what I want to do: give give other people the pleasure of of reading uh, crime. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. That passion obviously comes across in in your writing and in the success of your books as well. What would you say, apart from caring about it as a writer, what mm -hmm. makes a great crime novel? What are the key ingredients that has to be there? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> That's the, the the golden formula, you mean? Yeah. Exactly. I all the secrets. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think I think uh, for me it it has it has to have a good character. I mean, some people sometimes say that crime writers are either you know plot oriented or plot based or character based, and. The, uh, for me, it's always the character. That's the reason why I go back to series that I've read. It's it's not because the author writes great plots, but it's the character that draws me in every time, you know. Um, and so my stories always start with uh, me thinking of a character and then the plot builds around that character, you know. Um, so I think the character has to be someone that you connect with Mm -hmm. It might be might be a bad person. It might be a criminal, you know, that you don't really agree with, but it's someone that you still can understand in a way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the like for me the key ingredient. And then the story has to be fun. It has to. I like fast-paced stories that uh, move on and have movement in them and. Uh, doesn't have to be action, but just that the plot goes, you know, um, quite quickly. Um, I like that. It has to be a fun story with a good character. That's the Absolutely. golden rule, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And in terms of your characters, where do you find your ideas for your characters? And do you ever feel, do they, do they, how do they come to you? And do you ever worry that you might not be able to create another character for your next books? They, they, they're here in abundance. <laughs> no, it's, it, it comes from different places. It's really hard to say. I mean, uh, the idea for the, the, the cocaine smuggling um, uh, single mother is uh, uh, came from just an incident when I was caught with an illegal salami sausage coming into Iceland, you know, because Iceland is, you know, always a quarantine area and you're not supposed to import uncooked meat. And, uh, but everyone brings a salami from Denmark, you know, we love Danish salami. So I was just smuggling one of those and I, I was caught in the customs. And wow. they went, went through what my things and took my sausage and find me. And I was like, ah, oh, there's a story there, you know, and, um, and then thinking about, I mean, how do all these drugs get into Iceland, you know, uh, because Iceland is, uh, is an island, there is one international airport and one passenger ferry, and the country is full of drugs, imported drugs, you know, so uh, how do the smugglers get them into the country? I, th I think that's fascinating, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's just the... The, the plots awaken, you know, with questions, I think. 
That's amazing. I didn't realise we were going to be interviewing a real life criminal today. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Quentin. Um, and you have, obviously in your series, you keep, you've sort of followed characters through. So you have a really interesting kind of love affair going through with some of your protagonists. Um, how, do you ever worry about the pressures of creating a character and then revisiting them in each book? Or does it get easier the more you get to know them? Yeah, in a, in a way it's easier and also harder, you know. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, like with a trilogy, I uh, I mean, there's some uh, evolvement, and in Cage, I mean, uh, the the focus switches because in Snare, it's the the focus on the smugglers, uh, in Trap, it's the focus on the on the criminal cartels and the organizations behind the drug business, and in Cage, uh, it's more uh, there is focus on the user, on the on the victim of these crimes, you know. Uh, and uh, so, so the the focus, you know, shifts a little bit. But um, in a way, it's nice to have a character to come back to because you already know him or her, and uh, it's it's uh, you don't have to really think uh, so much about what what this person might do in each situation. But uh, in a way, it gets. Uh, tricky because you have to revisit and think um, I mean what color is her hair again <laughs> you know it's like you have to go back and and uh, you know be careful with the con consistency and all these all these tiny little details that have to be right with this character while when you're doing a new character you can just go on and uh, and you know just make it up as you go along and uh, n nothing will be wrong because it's a new character and nobody knows him or her yet so that's also nice you know but yeah. when i said goodbye to to uh, to this this trilogy uh, i was a bit sad to you know see them go but uh you brought some of them back yeah i mean they they make the occasional uh, uh, guest starring in <laughs> the later books <laughs> well fantastic villain made it a, made an appearance in in betrayal as well yeah. <laughs> that sounds so clever. And actually, this is a great chance for actually for you to both tell us how the sort of translation and how that works as you work together as a team. So obviously, Quinton knows your books really well inside out because he's translated yeah. them. So could you tell us a bit about that journey and like how much sort of back and forth there is in terms of the story and the plot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, Lilia lent me one of her, lent me a villain for one of my books. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is so much more connected than we would possibly have thought. Yeah, you know, a translating yeah. relationship would be. So, yeah. I mean, how did it happen? Tell it. Tell us about it. I needed a. I needed a, a bad guy for a small part in one of my books, and I realized because I've been working on Lily's book at the same time. Yeah. Um, I realized that this guy fitted the bill entire perfectly, yeah. so I asked nicely if I could borrow Ricky the Sponge. Yeah. Um, uh, and she said, no problem, as long as you just bring him back in one piece, don't kill him. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I, so Ricky the Sponge makes a guest appearance in one of my stories. Yeah. How did that work? I mean, do you, were you worried that Quentin would write something that you didn't think Ricky the Sponge would do? That's very trustful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just very interested. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I, I think my training of writing for theatre is good in that because I'm just uh, I I love it when the actors and the directors and other artists bring in some something of theirs, and you know magic is created when everyone puts a little bit of themselves mm. into the mix, you know. Mm. And uh, in a way, a translation also works like that, you know. But I I mean Quentin does great stuff. He would never butcher you know uh, butcher Ricky the Sponge or you know. Uh, at least not without permission. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did bring, I did give him back because you still needed him for the third book. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He needed to be alive. But yeah, I mean, it's. I. I think we are actually very, very lucky because uh, I mean, I knew Quentin before, and uh, and we are so lucky to have this um, translating relationship. But we are also friends, you know and each other's fans so we read each other's books and i wish i wish i wish i could have had uh, 
could be a, a translator to translate his books into Icelandic, but there's another guy that does that. So you can <laughs> you take over from him whenever you like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? You know. Uh, and, and so, how does it how does it work in terms of the book? So, you would your book have already been published through your publisher before it then gets translated, or is it different each yes, time? Yes. The, the, the English market is uh, two years behind, so I'm already uh, uh, two books now. Uh, I've written two books since Betrayal that's just coming out in, in Britain. So uh, because it takes this time, I mean, first is the contracts. My, my foreign rights agency has to sell the book to, a, to a, a publisher in the UK, and then it's the translating process. And then it's the uh, editing and stuff that needs to be done with the manuscript after the translation. Uh, and it just takes this time, you know. It, it probably could be done in a year, but it's nicer to have a little bit uh, more time, isn't it, Quentin? Not to yeah, be I mean, pressured to do it quickly. And also, I mean, your first book had already been, I mean, the first in, this, in the trilogy, trilogy had already been out in Iceland for quite some time before it was picked up by a publisher yeah. here. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's that's where the delay comes from, really. Otherwise, you could be about a year behind. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. And it, uh, it, it took a while to, mm. to 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 make it happen. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it's not necessarily a given that you would be able to translate the book. You've got to also go through the publishing process. Mm. So yeah. Whatever yeah. market you're trying to go into as well. Are you are you ever tempted to, with the benefit of hindsight and possibly not because in reality it doesn't sound like there is that much time in between but are you ever tempted to sort of revise the book based on the feedback you've got with the first publication or is it, that just not time for it <laughs> you mean into the when it when it's done in english again yeah so if you've had time to sort of see how people react to it is it sort of tempting yeah. to go back and you know change things a little bit or uh, I think I've twice corrected the sort of a mistake that I really wanted to fix. So that was fixed in the English translation and then it was re-edited for the English speaking market. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it was um, changed a little bit. I mean, uh, the yeah. sex was uh, cut down a bit. <laughs> the yeah. edited. All yeah. the rude bits were taken out, which I was really not happy about because I've done, I'd worked <laughs> hard on those. <laughs> That's so strange. Why? As in, it was taken out for the for when it was translated into English. Yeah, uh, it's, the, it's, the English it's, publisher it's, um, took all the rude bits out. Yeah, That's I think cool. it's a, it's an interesting. It's a it's a it's a cultural thing which I find very very interesting. Is that uh, is that different uh, countries? Because now my my books are published into fourteen languages, so uh, I, I can see a bit of difference uh, in between. Um, the, the cultural wishes, I mean, what is it exactly that bothers people, you know, uh, each market? Like the French, they like really, really love the sex scenes and they want, the French publisher wants more. You know, the English publisher does not like them and wants them cut down, you know. So it's just like nuances <laughs> like this, which are very interesting. And was it cut completely or just cut down in like length? It Where did you stop them in their sexual encounter? <laughs> the rude bits yeah. were were taken right down to to as little as possible. Yes, yeah, yeah. And the um, yeah, the dildo was taken out, wasn't it? Yeah, what? it's a shame. <laughs> it's very strange because I've read a lot of books that haven't had sex scenes cut. So that's a really interesting. How interesting. Yeah. I think it's yeah. also partly in this case, it, it's it's partly the publisher's personal preferences as well. Right. Yeah. 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 But we did keep the tiger. Yeah, we kept the tiger, yes. Yeah. The tiger. What happens had... with the tiger? <laughs> yeah. You'll have to read it and find out. <laughs> yeah. We, but we had to we had to fight to keep the tiger. Yeah, people thought the tiger was like uh, out of out of you know you know out of context, but uh, now the Tiger King series has shown us that uh, I mean <coughs> tigers and the drug business go like yeah. hand in hand. Yeah. But the tiger scene yeah. is probably the finest what the f moment I've seen for a very long time. <laughs> Thank it's you, Quentin. Brilliant. <laughs> a hand or a foot, Amadou, a hand or a foot. Exactly, yes. <laughs> very, very intrigued. It, are, there, are there things that just don't work? Like, I mean, the tiger sounds like it might be quite specific to the story rather than an Icelandic thing, but are there things that 
you just sometimes can't translate and you have to sort of rework mm. or cut entirely. There are things that uh, mm. swearing is hard to translate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because Icelandic swearing is either relatively mild or extremely profane and nothing in between. Mm. So it's the general sort of work a day, oh shit, oh bugger, that kind of thing is, is quite hard to translate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another book I worked on, not one of Lilia's, uh, the, the author wasn't very happy because I'd translated a, a, a fairly innocuous Icelandic profanity as fuck. Mm -hmm. But it, it, that's what fits fit to the character. It's a 25-year-old you know, policeman and he find, he's surprised. And, oh, that's what you'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that fitted the context and it fitted the character. Yeah. So it, it stayed in. Um, the other thing that's hard to translate is jokes. Yeah. yeah, you were telling us that last time, which yeah. I thought was really interesting, the idea yeah. of a joke being difficult to translate. Any kind of a play on words is always, is always a headache tr to translate. But you don't have many of those. <laughs> no, not so much. No, the one it's, thing... it's, you know, cultural, you know, connotations or, or like... Um, mm. I, I use quite a lot of like um, hints or remakes of like um, something from uh, what you call the folklore or folk yeah. tales about elves or hidden people or something like that, you know, uh, something from the Icelandic old mythology and stuff like that. And I drop these in there and just they're just in there, you know, and an Icelander would maybe understand them, uh, but an English reader wouldn't. So I try to do it in a way that, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't understand it, you know. Yeah. Um, I like seeing the elves in there. I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you. So, so many people don't see them because they don't know they're elves, you know. Exactly, you yeah. Just take them for normal people. And of course, yeah. in, in, in Betrayal, there's a witch. Yes, and there's a witch. Yeah. Amazing. And in yeah. terms of that, though, you can, you know, in terms of when you're talking about these sort of mythology that you're saying, that's mm -hmm. as in, as a reader of somebody who doesn't know about about that. I think that's really interesting. So I think it's good to keep those in. And have you just found yourself then sort of explaining maybe more than you would ever have felt the need to, but you're you're still keeping them in? Yeah, yeah. I think it's. I mean, it's it's because. I, I, I mean, Icelanders are so many times asked about the sagas, you know, because the sagas are our, you know, literary inheritance and uh, so many modern Icelandic writers base their work basically on the sagas. But if it's a good story, uh, it doesn't really matter. It, it shouldn't matter if it's based on the sagas or not. And I, I, you know, someone who knows the sagas would see it, uh, other people would just see it as a good story. And that's how I like to do it. I mean, it's a, a scene where a character in my book meets, you know, um, maybe a, a hidden person or, you know, is um, having a, an experience that's maybe uh, not very usual. Uh, it doesn't matter. You could, you could interpret this as a drunken person on the road or whatever, you know. Uh -huh. uh, so it doesn't really bother other readers, but it's nice to then, you know, explain maybe to people that there is another layer there that you can read into and explore and i like things like that that so you have like different layers and you can you know read it again and see another thing out of it mm. uh, you know it's just um trickster kind of uh, thing <laughs> and it sounds really like you you've had quite an international experience yourself so it sounds like living abroad and understanding different cultures as well yeah. as your experience as a playwright probably really helps it also sounds like you two have got quite a unique friendship and relationship but what's your view on sort of how how collaborative the translation process is typically mm -hmm. so would you typically discuss these things between you would it would it usually be the publisher that comments on those kind of cultural changes that need to be made like who drives these decisions well it's 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 both, I think. I mean, uh, we are there for each other. I mean, some occasionally Quentin sends me a question and I try my best to explain it or something, uh, or uh, or I am reading over something and I see something that, you know, he maybe misunderstood or didn't, you know, realize or something like that. But I think it's actually unusually little with us because Quentin is basically an Icelander. He lived here for... <laughs> A long time you know so uh and and you have your wife you can always ask her she's Icelandic I would ask her yeah <laughs> yeah so it's uh, you have your own dictionary at home yes 
you know. <laughs> there's a dictionary on the windowsill and there's a dictionary in the other room. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, yeah. Uh, but but I, I think it's because you know, you don't, don't only know the language, you know the culture because you lived here yeah. for such a long time. So it's, it's not really that much that needs explaining or you don't usually uh, come up with a lot of questions. It's the occasional okay. question and then, uh, I mean, and sometimes we, we are struggling to find the word or something and we, you know, uh, you well, know, kind generally of... Generally, if there's, um, if Lindia questions a word mm -hmm. then, or suggests another word, the upshot won't be the word that she, she suggests. No. <laughs> or the one that I put in there, it'll be it'll be a third solution somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we'll we'll find a yeah. There'll be a third alternative that that fits both. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's quite it can be quite a collaborative. Yeah, yeah it can be it can be quite collaborative. Yeah. But in general, I don't we don't discuss it beforehand because I don't tend to read the book before I start translating. No. Well, I don't I don't with Lilia's books anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll because you know books. they're fun. You know you want to translate them before you start, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, but, but then, of course, comes in the editor also who reads over and and makes questions and suggestions. And sometimes we need to discuss something that uh, that has come up there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and there are a few idioms that need to be sorted out as well. That things that mm. well, that we understand perfectly and, and yeah. are, are perfectly obvious to us. Of course, well, of course, we understand. Everybody should understand that. But no, yeah, but yeah. why is it like that? And sometimes the edit editors will ask for too much. Mm. They want too much explanation. They like everything. They don't, they, it's like they, they sometimes want to remove any hint of mystery of any kind. Mm. <laughs> I guess they're trying to make it accessible to as many people as possible is maybe the way that they're thinking. Yeah, yeah so I'm sure that's the thinking, but yeah. you, can, you can take these things a bit too far. Not as creative. Yeah, mysterious. but it's it's also because Iceland. I mean, Icelandic is a mini language. It's a very it's a very small language. It's only spoken by three hundred and fifty thousand people. Yeah. And and when you're writing in a language like that, it's so based in the culture. And in Icelandic, if you say something like uh, you know, uh, he walked past the Parliament House, in everybody's head up comes a picture of the Parliament House because every Icelandic speaker knows how how it looks like. Mm. you know because we only have this one parliament house and uh, you know everyone knows where it is and what it looks like but for an english reader you know you have to give a description you know yeah, yeah like a, a few words stone building yeah. something like that you know yeah because everybody knows the parliament building everybody knows yeah. what Asia looks like everybody knows what a snow drift feels like exactly. everybody knows what yeah. Bayern's best days you don't, you don't have to explain these things but in exactly. english yeah. we, we have to yeah. add a little yeah. bit of color to yeah. so it comes across yeah. And this is the thing when you're writing in Icelandic, you don't have to explain so many things because everyone knows what it is and it would just sound silly to explain it. But then comes into English, sometimes you have to add like these little explanatory um, sentences into it. And there, you know, both Quentin and, and the editor, you know, have been very helpful because... Uh, I mean, sometimes these explanations to me sound silly because I already know this, you know, and everybody knows this, but of course the English uh, readership doesn't, you know. Yeah. So this is the art of translating, I think, is uh, trans, you know, uh, planting not... the story in, in the mind of, uh, of a, a readership that doesn't have the same cultural experience and the same cultural background. And this is the art of it, even uh, finding this balance you know keeping some mystery and but explaining enough so so that people aren't left out in the dark well this is also why translation is such a such a dark art as well yes because if you're translating if i'm translating news material or or you know a handbook or something like that you want to be very literal and very close to what the original was you don't want to divert from it in, in any yeah. way but yeah. when it comes to a to, to fiction it's a different story and you're not really translating it Mm -hmm. you're you're retelling the story in the words the author would have used if they'd done it in english yes mm -hmm. so you're, you're you're really telling the story over again yeah mm -hmm. rather than any kind of a direct translation and i think particularly for um i imagine the descriptions about the setting and explaining that to a non-icelandic audience probably adds so much to the weight of the book and and the atmosphere and i was wondering in general like what are both of your, I know you're very involved in the crime scene, <laughs> crime fiction scene generally, 
what are your perceptions about how UK crime or US crime compares to crime fiction in Iceland? Are there different, is there a different tone to it? If somebody hasn't read Icelandic crime fiction before, for example, what would they expect that they might not get in the UK scene? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit, yeah. tough question. I, th I, think, oh, I think Icelanders feel very, very close to the Scottish uh, crime mm. fiction in a way. And of course, the other Nordic countries, you know, the Nordic, yeah. whole Nordic noir thing. I mean, I, mean, I think uh, Henning Mankell and uh, Sjöval and Valo are, are the, you know, biggest influences on Icelandic crime fiction, I think. Uh, but we Icelanders love the Scottish authors. They're very, very popular here. Uh, so I think there is something in common there. Uh, it's the, the cold, think, dark. That is the setting, yeah. Because the, yeah, the something like that, yeah. And there is a, always a social kind of a social undertone or undercurrent in a way. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's so hard to know in Iceland if we have uh, something that defines Icelandic crime fiction because we are so few of us. I mean, last year there were 20 crime novels published in Iceland. Wow. That's it, you there know. So so it's, but, the, but there are so many compared to how it used to be 20 odd years ago. That's true, yeah. You, you can hardly throw a brick in Reykjavik now without hitting a crime riser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean, and so in, in terms of you and, and talking to other crime writers and maybe inspiring people to go into writing, do yeah. you have any tips for anybody who's just starting out or anybody who specifically just wants to write crime? Do you have any sort of tips for those people? Yes, I think, uh, I think the best tip for any writing uh, is that you have to be passionate about the story. I think it's not a good way to start out from a point of view is that what will people like? I think you have to write just the story that you like, that you want to tell a story that, you know, uh, would make you curious. Uh, I think this, that's the only way to go, because if you try to write something that will be popular or is popular or in you know, uh, some try to to write in somebody else's style. It's it's not going to work. It's because uh, you have to invest in the work emotionally. So just uh, write a story or a poem or a, a play or a, a manuscript that you know really, uh, really is uh, something, something personal to you and yourself. makes you passionate. Don't you agree, you, Quentin? You have to you have to write what you want to read. Yeah. Yeah, yes. write what you what what you like to read because if you try and write something that's yes. doesn't chime with yourself, then it's never going to have that spark of energy to it. That's true. Yeah. And you can't try and second guess things either because if you try and write in today's genre, then by the time you're published or you get round to sending it to a publisher, that's going to be old news. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's no point trying to chime with the moment because it, by, by the time you get there, it's gone. Yeah. And you can't try and predict it either. <laughs> That's true. And what about that publishing that publishing journey and your advice for people that might be might be writing but just not know how to break down those barriers and, and become published? Mm -hmm. Would you have any advice for them about how to go about it or keep motivated? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I've been so extremely, you know, lucky in my career. You know, I, I saw a competition, sent the book into it, wrote it, and then I wrote a screenplay and it was uh, like a, a stage play and it was produced and, you know, won awards and was very, very popular. And so I've been like, a, I've been so blessed in, in a way. So maybe I'm not the best person to... Um, give advice on, on how to break down these barriers that I know that so many people face because so many people are writing, I mean, such good stories and they never get published, which is uh, so awful. But uh, I think it's, it's very important to believe in your work, you know, uh, and uh, if you believe in it strongly, you're a better ad advocate for it. If you if you have doubts about your story, then you have to sit down and improve it. You have to improve it until you're confident that you can promote it and you know uh, tell everyone with and believe it yourself. I mean, this is a great story. You know, um, I think that's the the way to go. Uh, 
What do you say, Quentin? I think you just need to keep chipping away at it. Yeah. I really and do. That. And don't, <laughs> don't be, and don't be discouraged. And, and the key thing as well is, is, I think, is to find, is to, is to get other people's opinion on what, you work, what, you, what you've done and what you've written. Mm. But don't ask anybody who loves you. Yeah. <laughs> don't ask your mum or your partner because they'll say, oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. My, that, my, my partner sounds partner. nicer than mine. Yeah, I'm <laughs> busy, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I always have my partner read the first read over because she always said it's your best one yet. You know, <laughs> every time. So Excellent. that's uh, that's the first reader, and then you go like, ah, oh, that's yeah. nice to hear. And then, you know, <laughs> and then my parents read over and they basically say the same thing. So then it goes to the editor. So <laughs> it's good well, to, well, go to go to the different advice. But it's maybe not helpful, is it? <laughs> my wife doesn't read them until until she can have them in paperback. Really? No, she doesn't look at it at all. <laughs> Very restrained, isn't it? Living with yeah. an author and not reading a manuscript. Wow. I yeah. know. It's weird. She's a strange woman. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she likes the build up, probably. That's what she likes. She likes it when it's all ready and ready yeah. to go. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> Lilia, this was absolutely, fan honestly, fascinating. And I think we we are desperate to get our hands on these books and yes. find out what happens with that tiger. And <laughs> I'm <laughs> sad that we can't have as many of the sort of sexy scenes that we might have had if we could learn Icelandic. But, uh, but Lilia, we know you've got um, you've got a new book coming out and you can yes. get it on pre-order. So tell us where we can find your books and your new book. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my books are of course on the uh, on Amazon and uh, the usual bookstores uh, in America. I, uh, I people have been having some hard time to get it, but they're on Amazon, so uh, that's that's the easy way to go. Um, uh, Kobo but, as well. Uh, sorry. And Kobo. Ah, uh, Kobo. Yeah, of course, Kobo. And, aud uh, and Audible. Yes, and then they, we have Audible audiobooks, which are very nice. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, Betrayal is the new one that's out in uh, August on ebook and uh, October on paper. Mm -hmm. It's a standalone though. Standalone political thriller. Amazing. Uh, with a witch. With a witch. And how do and how like, do people get in touch with you? you was great. <laughs> sorry, how do people get in touch with you if they want if they want to? Are you on Twitter? Oh, sorry. Are you on social media or anything? If anybody wants yes, to Yes, yes, yes. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So uh, just look, just write in my surname. Oh, that's a joke. <laughs> Lilia. Well, that's my as well. <laughs> yeah, this Lilia1972 uh, on Twitter. So 